Well, listen, I, I really want us to get into the word this morning, and so we're going to get right there, man. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Join me in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Praise the Lord. I have this morning just one verse of Scripture as my text. You'll see up on the screen the title of my message today is Experiencing the Joy of Sins Forgiven. I don't know if you're there this morning. I hope that you are, that you reflect on the fact, as we did with communion today, that sins are washed away and that you're forgiven. And there's no going back to that. Amen? Thank God. And, but here's the thing. We're going to talk a little bit about this beatitude. In Matthew 5 and 4, where Jesus says these words, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. There is a blessing that comes from mourning. And I want you to take a few minutes and let's look at this particular beatitude together. And I want us to see some specific things concerning the subject of sins forgiven as it relates to this beatitude. He says, listen, there are different kinds of mourning. There is natural mourning. For instance, the grief that we experience over the loss of something or someone, we have what's called a natural kind of mourning. There's a spiritual kind of mourning that comes with the grieving over sin. And when we realize what David realized, it's really sin against God. There is a mourning that takes place. You see, when I look at this passage or this verse of Scripture, blessed are those who mourn, for they are comforted. If, if we don't understand the original text of what is being said here or the original language, we might go into a different realm of, well, they're mourning over the loss of something or someone. We go into the natural mourning process here. But really, this is a spiritual mourning. And when you study this, you realize Jesus is talking about the mourning that comes over your sin. Now, you can mourn over sin and do nothing about it. Or you can mourn over your sin and get it right and get it taken care of. And guess what happens? There's a blessing. He says, you're comforted how many of you know when you gave your sins over to jesus and he washed you and made you whole that something new happened people say man my heart feels good something happened something's going on there's a blessing that comes when you walk with sins forgiven can i get an amen this communion we remembered this morning reminds us of our need your need my need for forgiveness. But we also need a true recognition. If forgiveness truly comes, there needs to be, church, a full, true recognition of our own personal sin and our need for repentance. For spiritual mourning is the key to overcoming sin, particularly sinful habits. Now, if we go back through history, particularly we go back through history to the days of the, the Israelite people in the book of Judges. Have you read the book of Judges lately? You will find in the book of Judges, there's a perpetual cycle that goes on with the people of Israel. You know what happens? This is the same cycle that you and I can deal with too. Here's what the cycle is with human nature. There first comes this playing around with sin or flirting with it. It's kind of like that looks like fun. You know, pleasure of sin, there is some pleasure there. The Bible says, but it lasts for a short while and then it leads to destruction. So, oh, there's fun in that. It's just, you know, disobeying God and doing your own thing. They started playing around with sin and they started flirting with it. And you know what happens? Oh, the Bible actually says flirting with sin leads to sorrow. And it's not a godly sorrow. It's a... It's a, it's a sorrow of the heart of the consequence of sin. 
Then there's this, well, you know what happens? If you get close enough to sin for a while, if you get close enough flirting with something that you know isn't right for you and right according to God's word, you know what's going to happen? You're going to find yourself right in it. You're going to find yourself right in it, committing sin and the consequences to follow. That's what the cycle was. That's how it started with the people of Israel and the book of Judges, and that's how it works for, for us today if we're not careful. Then God brings those around about them, the enemies, to take them captive so they serve their enemies. You know what happens? They have enough of God in them and realizing what the Word says that the Holy Spirit convicts their heart and then they start crying out to God for forgiveness. They start crying out to God, God, against you, we sin. We're, we, we're so sorry. We, we have failed you, Lord. And there's, a, there's repentance that happens, and there's, there's a turning over their heart back to God. And you know what God does? He shows mercy. He shows mercy. The book of Judges, God raised them up. He raised up Gideon. He raised up Samson. He raised up many. Deborah, you go through the list of all the judges that were raised up to deliver them. And God does give mercy. How many of you thankful for his mercy? Amen. You've cried out. You receive mercy. But hello, you know where the cycle happens? We get comfortable in the mercy. And if we're not watchful for our life, we can start going back to playing with sin again and flirting with sin again. And the cycle continues. God wants us out of the cycle for some, the cycle of sin and repentance and coming back around again goes on for years. It needs to be broken. It needs to be dealt with. And when it is, then you're comforted. So the mourning results in the blessings of knowing sins forgiven, the joy of heart. People talk about, I got the joy of salvation. You'll never know true joy of salvation until there's the mourning over sin and the realizing that I can't live like that any longer. You know, somebody here today or somebody that's listening later on on this message, you're in a place where it's like, I just want to experience total victory. I don't want to go back through the cycle. I'm tired of it. I want to live a victorious life. I don't want to have a habit that hangs on me, that drags me down, and I repent of it, and before long I'm back in it again. God wants to give us total, complete victory and deliverance. Are you with me? Say amen. <clears throat> there needs to be godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. And leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. I mention godly sorrow because that and only that will break the cycle of any habitual sin or anything in your life that becomes a hindrance to you as you go after the Lord in true repentance. I came across an old saying, which is so true. Are you with me? Listen. What the eye doesn't see, the heart doesn't grieve over. What the eye doesn't see, the heart doesn't grieve over. Have you ever spilt anything? I have many times, still do. When you were a kid and you spilt something, you're like, I got to cover this up. I don't want mom or dad to find out I spilt this. You find something to lay over top of what was spilt. Because if they don't see it, I don't get in trouble. But you don't see. I'm guilty uh, of something. And we have a candle that kind of fell on the floor. It's a nice new candle that we got. And I put a little dent on the one side of the candle. You know what I told Julie? Just turn it to the back so nobody will see it. So nobody sees it. No harm, right? Everything looks great. That's a simple thing. But you know what we like to do in our lives? We put on that front. We put on that facade. We, we cover things up because we don't want anybody to see it. Because if it's out of the sight, it's out of the heart, right? And that's not, listen, it's still there. And you know it. 
And it's something that when you get close to God, sometimes in a worship service, you know what happens? You start realizing, "Uh uh-oh, God sees that. (laughs) He says, I want you to lift up holy hands and worship me. And you're like, "Uh uh-oh, how am I lifting up holy hands when I know that I've been trying to hide something from God? You can maybe hide it from other people, but you can't hide it from God. Amen? You can't. Hmm. Spiritual mourning begins when you start seeing your sin or your habit or whatever it is for what it is. How do you and I experience the joy of sins forgiven? Let me share you, with you three quick ways that you can enjoy, the, have the experience of the joy of sins forgiven. And the first and foremost one is so simple, but so often neglected. And that's get into God's word. You know, we can get into the latest movie, the latest show that's coming out, the latest series. There's a list of things that we can get into, but where does the word of God rank in your life? As you open the Bible, as though you are reading God's very words, that's exactly what's happening. You are reading God's very words and thoughts to your heart. This word of God that you open and you start reading it. And it's as if God is speaking it to you directly. The path to true spiritual mourning over sin begins as you see your life and your struggle as God sees it. As God sees it. No one else. For the children, it's not how the parents see it. For us as adults, it's not how our other siblings see it or our parents or those that we work with. It's all about how God sees it. By nature, we don't know what grieves God and offends him until we start reading his word to our hearts. Is it amazing how people today are like living in areas of sin in their life and they're, they think nothing of it? They think nothing of it. It might be because they haven't read God's word, heard God's word preached. You know, we don't need just a lot of love preaching. I mean, I'm not against preaching love, but how many know we need to preach what sin is? And we need to preach what repentance is. And unless that happens, we don't get a full picture of what even what communion is when we think about him dying for our sins. And we need to know what those sins are, what, how the Spirit works in our life. One of the serious problems we have today is the lack of reading the Bible. Come on. I want you to think about it in your own life. One of the most serious problems we have today in the church, particularly, but in our nation, and I'll tell you that in a moment, is the lack of reading the Bible. I just looked at a recent survey. I'm talking 2021 recent survey of adult Americans and Bible reading and found some things in their responses. Here's what I noticed in this recent survey. And I'm talking adult Americans just across the board. 29% of adult Americans this year have never read the Bible for themselves at all this year. When asked the question, have you read your Bible this year? The answer was no. 29% of adult Americans this year. Another 21% said they've read it for themselves maybe once or twice this year. Of that survey, 50% either read it once or twice or not at all this year. Is it no wonder that people don't know what God is saying to their hearts, what pleases him and what displeases him? Are you with me? Now that is adults, whether they profess to know Christ or not. That's what that survey was. But I would dare say that even about followers of Jesus Christ, it's more than saying, yeah, I read the Bible once a week because I go to church and hear the pastor preach it. I'm talking about you individually knowing what the Bible says, what the Word of God says. If you're going to experience the joy of sins forgiven, you need to what the Lord says. It'll open your eyes. If people don't want to have their eyes open, they'd rather just have that 
turn to the back so nobody sees it. Under the rug so nobody sees it. You try to fool others, you try to fool yourself, but you can't fool God. It brings things to light. It brings things to the surface. The commandment, it says in Psalm 19, 8, the commandment of the Lord or the word of God is pure, enlightening what? The eyes. God's word will open those eyes to what God calls sin. As we read it, we'll see where, where sin can get a grip on our life. And that's what's happening even today is somehow sin is getting a grip on people's lives. What do we do? Yes, we get into the word. But once you start reading the word, you got to do something else. You got to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Do you know what it's like to walk into a dark garage, a dark basement, or a cellar? Anybody been into one of those places lately? Maybe down in that dark basement or that dark garage or cellar, <coughs> there could be items that you just not you have just not gotten rid of. You have some things you've just been storing for years. You're not going to admit it, are you? I just keep it and keep it and keep it. Maybe it's got some sentimental reasons. Or maybe it's something like, I might use that someday. Or, you know, that's got value. I can't throw that away. So you got some things that are being stored in that dark basement or that dark garage or cellar. You might even have something in there that's unopened gifts. I hope not any unopened gifts from last Christmas. Right? But you might have accumulated what we call just plain old junk. Trash. Maybe some things should never be there in the first place. And you just might go in there or down in that cellar and it's dark in that basement. And you start smelling something. It could be a dead critter. Right? You all know what I'm talking about? in those kinds of places oh now listen with me would you consider for a moment that there is a biblical picture here of what the heart could be like let's be honest could we this morning have sometimes in our hearts some dark places some places where we would prefer not to go prefer to just keep it in the back corner keep it hidden you got a closet you just as soon never open for what might be behind it folks we need a spiritual cleaning when we cooperate with the holy spirit of god there must be a removing of that that shouldn't be there are you with me there's two kinds of lights. There's the flashlight. Those of you that are with us Thursday know where I'm going with part of this. There's the flashlight and the floodlight. Do you know the difference? Can you imagine if the Holy Spirit just bombarded your heart with a floodlight right now? Whoosh. You know, sometimes looking into that floodlight is a little overwhelming, isn't it? The floodlight of the Holy Spirit could be almost overwhelming. You'd see everything all in one shot. Here it is. To the extent of the full knowledge of the sin of your whole life, all at one time. I don't know that we could handle that. Could you? Isaiah had a glimpse of the Lord. I shouldn't say a glimpse. He had a vision of the Lord in Isaiah 61. It was kind of like a floodlight, and he said, in the presence of God and he's like woe is me and he fell before the Lord as though dead I, I stand in the presence of a holy God I, I can't stand this and he, and he fell before the Lord and he pleaded on behalf of the people but here is how God is so gracious to you it's not with a floodlight but with a flashlight 
The Holy Spirit will work when we work with him and cooperate with him. The flashlight of the Spirit of God begins to find the hidden areas of our life, those dark corners of our heart that needs a flashlight to see into that corner, to see into that area of the life that needs to be changed, that needs to be forgiven, that needs to be repented of. So God's grace can help you deal with the junk. The stuff that needs to go. As a follower of Jesus Christ, this is a lifelong process. For just as the Holy Spirit would shine the flashlight into an area of your life and you say, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me, help me to live better for you, help me to walk in your image, Lord Jesus, then the Holy Spirit says, let's get the flashlight out again. You say, oh, Holy Spirit, can you stop for a moment? And he shines another spot and another spot. But don't be discouraged by it because you are conforming to the image of Christ. You're becoming more like him if you deal with it, if you cooperate with it. He says, you know what we call that? It's a big word. It's called sanctification. It's a lifelong process of becoming more like him and as we cooperate with him hey when when listen when that is dealt with and that's taken care of in your life are you like man i sure regret doing that you ever thought i don't i sure regret doing that no you're always thankful you dealt with it as a matter of fact you're joyful because you got the victory over that area in your life i have a great grandfather that my grandpa told me about his dad he was traveling in during the days of the horse and buggy. And he was traveling with his horse and buggy down the street. And he had an issue with anger. He had an issue with anger. And the Holy Spirit of God kept dealing with him about it. I mean, he loved Jesus. He loved the Lord. But you can love the Lord and still have things you're dealing with. And can I get a witness on that, right? You still have things you're dealing with, Right? And so that flesh, uh, that anger kept dealing. And he was so overwhelmed with the fact that he needed to get the victory of it. The Holy Spirit flashlight was dealing with it so strongly that he was on that horse and buggy. And he had an encounter with the Lord as his heart reached out to the heart of God. And he got his victory that day while he was with the horse and buggy going down the road. And he came back to his, his, uh, his son, which would be my grandpa. And he said, the Lord and I dealt with that. And he never had to deal with that anger like that ever again. It wasn't that there wasn't temptation still there. You can deal with it and still have temptation, right? But he had the victory over it. And there was rejoicing over it. And you know what? Even in your own life, how many you think that there can be some cycles of some stuff? that you fight with. Maybe it's something that you learned from your parents or something that you were raised with or how you responded to things or how things are right now in your own life. Oh God, as a child of God, Lord, take the flashlight where I don't want you to go. Remove the rug off the floor where there's been a spilt for years. Turn that candle around so I can see the dead for what it really is and fess up to it. Lord, help me. And when you truly do this and give it over to God, you'll never regret it. And there will be a comforting that comes from the morning. And you will realize as you partake of communion together, like we did today, that it's under the blood and he removes it as far as the east and from the west as he so far removed my transgressions from me. Oh, that we would be like Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. May that be your prayer as you cooperate with the Holy Spirit and as the word of God 
speaks to your heart. And here's the third way you can deal with this sin and, and live a life of the joy of your of sins forgiven is make fellowship and building relationships with your church family a priority. Make fellowship and building relationships with your church family a priority. I love it when I see the church family getting together. You know, that's one of the greatest, I, I, first of all, seeing someone get right with God ranks at the top, right? Someone get right with God, someone receive their healing, someone, a relationship restored, all these wonderful things. But I love it when I see the church family getting together. It's kind of like having the sheep, but the sheep all know how to get along. And they're not running off to other corners to be away from everybody. But they want to be together. There is a fellowship there. A relationship there that is healthy and good. James 5, 16. He says this when we're together in fellowship and relationship. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. You know there's power in togetherness. Whether two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. If any two agree on one thing, it shall be done. There's the power that comes in a relationship with the body of Christ. Our young adults, man, you guys are awesome. Young adults are meeting on Sunday nights and man, I'm a little jealous. I'm not a young adult anymore. You guys are getting together and having fellowship. You're breaking bread and having tacos tonight. But you know what? You're going to have fellowship in the word together and pray together. That's what the body of Christ is all about. It doesn't mean you have to show up and say, here's all my dirty laundry and here's my trash in my back corner garage. That's not what this is about. This is about encouraging one another and true. When someone suffers, we all mourn with them. We all, we're, and that's the natural mourning, but it's the, it's the going along with them in their praying and their agreement and laying hands and believing for healing. All of those things that are important to the body of Christ happen as we get together, your heavenly father birthed the church for many good reasons. And one of those reasons, are you ready? Is for you. Say this with me. The church is for me. Church is for me. To encourage another in their faith until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why relationships within the body are a wonderful gift from God. God did not call us to follow Christ so that our life would remain unchanged. No. But as we help one another, we live a life of enjoying and experiencing the blessings, the promises, the testimonies of God. There's nothing that thrills my heart more than if I'm going through something and somebody else has gone through it too and they got their victory. How did you do it? What did God do for you? I want that for my life. The testimony of others encourages us so that we also can live in our place of victory. Thank God for that. But before I close the message this morning, let me share with you ways to go about mourning for sin. And the first one is this. If we're going to mourn for sin, we got to be specific about the sin that so easily entangles us. Be specific about the sin that so easily entangles you. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything. Did you hear that? Everything that hinders, and here it is, and the sin that so easily entangles us. I believe that spiritual mourning over sin has a clear focus. You know why? Because the writer of Hebrews made it clear that you can know of a specific sin that is entangling you. So you need to call it out for what it is. This is it, Lord. This is my sin. This is what I need to be forgiven of. This is what I need to be um, repented of. This is where I need to change. I need to get victory, Lord. I acted out of anger. I tend to act out of bitterness. I tend to want to get even and show revenge. I tend to hold my hurt feelings close to my heart, and it affects me in 
negative ways. Lord, my thoughts seem to always go to the critical. Lord, I always seem to be negative. Lord, I don't want to always be unkind with my words. And the lists, they can go on, can't they? Whatever specific thing it is in your life, a thought pattern, an action, an attitude, whatever these things are, we are told to, from the word of God to throw that off because it easily entangles us. You need to, when that spotlight of the Holy Spirit, or not spotlight, I said spotlight, but the flashlight rather, shows you that area in your life, you need to do this. You need to immediately pick it up and take it to the curb. You, don't, you know what I don't like? Is I got garbage waiting to go out Thursday morning and I don't want it sitting in the garage for three days. Are you with me on that? It's like I want that out of my garage now. Right? I don't want to keep it there. I don't want to store my trash and store my garbage. I want that out to the curb now. That needs to be the attitude of our heart even now. Oh, God. Not only are you to be specific about it, because it easily entangles you, but you need to consider what your sin has done before God. The record, we read the recorded words of David in his time of repentance in Psalm 51, 4, speaking of having an understanding of the weight of a person's sin. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil. He calls it evil even. Man, evil in your sight. We know that his sin, David's sin, had great consequences toward others. But at its heart, but really at the very point of it it was his heart he knew that his sin was offending and against God and in God's eyes there's no small sin folks it's all sin each of us needs times of heart searching reflection on the consequences of unrepentant sin and our relationship with God and so today again as we took of communion we were reminded of the words of Paul and I read them to you in 1 Corinthians 11 a man ought to examine himself see if there's anything standing in the way of my relationship with God. Lord, and if there is, I confess it and I repent of it. Sin that is not dealt with will affect your service for Christ. It'll affect your worship. It'll affect your testimony. It'll affect your relationships. And it will keep you at a distance from God. Third way about mourning for sin is remember what your sin did to Christ. On top of those two, remember what it did to Christ. The punishment that brought you peace was placed upon him. I came across this quote and I read it to you. Jesus Christ did not hang on the cross for sins in general, but for sins in particular. Maybe you and I need to start thinking of it in those terms. Sins that have names to them, dates, faces, for which there is and should be real punishment. And yet he took all of those things, all of those names and dates and places and things that were done, and he, had put, it, he put it on the cross and Jesus bore it there for you. So spiritual mourning brings us to the foot of the cross. You see what you did and how much he loves you to enjoy sins forgiven. So it comes back to the whole point of the message this morning. As we mourn over what needs to be mourned over and repented over and forgiven for, Comfort comes. Joy comes. Shouts of victory come. I came to Jesus weary, worn, and sad. He took my sins away. He took my sins away. 
And now his love has made my heart so glad. He took my sins away. The load of sin was more than I could bear. He took them all away. He took them all away. And now on him I roll my every care. He took my sins away. No condemnation have I in my heart. He took my sins away. He took my sins away. His perfect peace he did to me impart. He took my sins away. If you will come to Jesus today, he'll take your sins away. He'll take your sins away and keep you happy in his love each day. He'll take your sins away. Many of you know I read from a hymn. He took my sins away. How about you this morning, friend? Has he taken your sins away? Is there anything that's laying there before you and God? Young people, is there anything in our life that stands between us and God? He wants to take those sins away. We mourn, yes, because we've broken our, command, our covenant, our relationship with God by sinning, and we've offended God. But God is so gracious, and he loves us so much. And he paid the price. There's no sin too big that God can't forgive. Isn't that amazing? We sing that song, Amazing Love. Isn't that great? This morning, my prayer is, is that you experience, we as a body of believers, together as a fellowship, will experience greater joy in our hearts. Man, we'll come together. Jared, we'll come together on a Sunday morning, and we'll start singing when we sing that song. He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. In your heart, there's a joy of knowing he took your sins away. You are his child, called of God, a place prepared for you in glory. And as I live my life, I live in reverent fear of the Lord. I don't live like the world. I don't go in the cycle of sin and play around and flirt and then go into the place where the devil brings guilt and condemnation and the Holy Spirit comes along and brings conviction and you realize what your sin has done and you repent only to find yourself going back in the cycle again. May God break that in our lives, whatever it might be. May God restore to you the joy of your salvation. May in Psalm 51, and you might want to read that psalm again today, be like David and say, Lord, I need forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Lord, I ask you to give me a clean heart. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Lord, I ask you for a renewed spirit. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And ask the Lord, Father, help me to be useful in works of service for you. For God, you work all things for the good for those who love him. Romans 8, 28. Bow your heads with me this morning, would you? Father, I thank you for your word to our hearts today. Lord, it's my desire and my prayer for each of us to experience the joy and the comfort of sins forgiven. Lord, let no one leave here walking and carrying the weight of sin. Lord, we yield it to you. We surrender it to you. We give it to you, Father. Lord, take it. Take my sin away. 
Heads bowed and eyes closed. Are you here today? And you'd say, Pastor, Pastor Dave, I know that some things me and the Lord are dealing with right now, and I'm turning it over to him. I'm surrendering it to him. Please remember me in prayer today. I'm just surrendering it to him. No one's looking around. You say, Pastor, please remember me. I'm, I'm turning something over to God. I'm surrendering it to God. Yes, yes. I'm surrendering it to God. God bless you. I'm giving it to God. I'm surrendering it to him. Oh, in this moment, church, in this moment, let the flashlight of the Holy Spirit do his work in your life. Oh God, is it your desire? You want to please him. The one who gave his life for you, paid the price. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, by the Holy Spirit of God and I will not fight the Spirit. I will work in cooperation with the Spirit of God and I will surrender it all to you. Oh God, help me today. Restore joy to people's lives today. Thank you, Father, for loving us. I'm just giving you this moment right now. I want you in this moment to do business with God, whether it's our young adults, our middle-agers, or our seniors, whoever you fall in that category that covers all of us. If there's something in your life the Holy Spirit is dealing with right now, just surrender it to God ask forgiveness turn from it make a commitment say oh god i need your help holy spirit help me father i want to please you hallelujah would you stand with me jesus let